Well, this material relates to Section 3 of Chapter 30 of the OpenStax College Physics textbook, uh, Bohr's Model of the Atom. So there's some uh, experimental results that uh, need to be explained for, let's, let's talk about the hydrogen atom. Um, you know, how do these spectral lines uh, originate? What is the situation? Why is there kind of this pattern, wide spacing, a little narrower, a little narrower, a little narrower, and this continues out into the ultraviolet. Uh, but the Baumer emission spectrum um, in the visible range of wavelengths and needed an explanation what's creating these certain wavelengths. Every hydrogen atom emits light at these particular wavelengths and colors here. We don't have a wavelength scale. Um, but there was a person by the name of Balmer who looked at this data and looked at the wavelength numbers that were here and by trial and error developed a formula that would predict the wavelength of the uh, Balmer series lines. So this formula says any wavelength you want can be calculated if you start with 364.5 nanometers multiply by the quantity of n squared divided by the quantity n squared minus 4. But n is restricted, it's quantized to integers that start with 3. So 3, 4, 5, etc. So you know, we can't put 2 in here because we're dividing. I had 2 squared minus 4, that would be a 0. Uh, so n starts at 3. And this will give you the correct wavelengths for the Balmer series of lines. But it's an empirical formula, it's from data. It is not derived from a theory and uh, scientists would rather have some theory, some basis for this. So 1800s, um, 1885, it's a mystery as to what's happening here. It's going to take a few years to work that out. Um, let's take a look at some other uh, spectra. Iron is much more complicated and the hydrogen spectrum is the easiest to understand. As it turns out, there's only one electron in hydrogen atoms and that produces a simpler set of possible uh, energies and thus frequencies, thus wavelengths. For iron, there are many electrons and consequently more possibilities for um, energies and frequencies of light being given off uh, by the atom. Uh, so Balmer uh, looked at the hydrogen spectrum. Bohr that we're about to delve into looked at the hydrogen spectrum. Another fact about the spectra, if we look at gas that's emitting light and we get an emission spectrum, and I believe this is mercury, although I have not looked it up, um, but we have an emission spectrum. Or if we're looking at a black body, that will give us our continuous uh, spectrum, and we have a thin gas of material, of the same material that created the emission spectrum, a thin gas in between us and the black body, and it's cooler than the black body, then we see the absorption spectrum. What you should notice here is that the wavelengths of the emission spectrum lines are identical to the wavelengths of the absorption spectrum line. There must be a reason for that. You know, it's not just random that these uh, uh, six absorption lines have the same wavelength as the six emission lines. So uh, what's to be done about this? So Bohr, he had uh, Rutherford's planetary model to kind of start working with, but he had the, uh, he used the wavelengths of the light coming off of the hydrogen atom and um, in a way to talk about energies of electrons in atoms. So we have a uh, uh, drawing here of this planetary model, again the dense nucleus, and we have an electron in orbit. I want to warn you right away that the Bohr model of the atom is not correct. It's useful for hydrogen, but it's not useful for any other element. And uh, there's a, a big difference between our current understanding of how electrons are uh, uh, to be thought of in an atom. It's much different than this planetary model drawing. The electrons do not have definite circular orbits around the nucleus. Uh, but Bohr mod made this planetary model. It, it's pretty good at explaining the wavelengths for hydrogen. So that's why we talk about it. 
it, it uh, sort of makes a step towards the more correct model. So we have uh, uh, what we'll call in the future principal quantum numbers. Uh, the first orbit, n equals 1, then n equals 2, then n equals 3. And as we move away from the nucleus, the energy becomes more positive. The energy of any one of these orbits is negative, and that's uh, expected. These are bound orbits. The total energy is uh, um, negative for bound orbits. So Bohr says we're going to get light emitted from an atom when we have a change in the energy of the electron in the atom. So the energy uh, difference between two energy levels, that becomes the photon energy. Uh, so E equals HF. The E here is the energy of the upper level minus the energy of the lower level. An energy difference creates a photon. This is for emission. The absorption process just goes in reverse. Light comes in of this exact wavelength. And if an electron is available here down at n equals 1, then that electron can absorb the energy and move up to n equals 2 level. Um, so Bohr made this model. The orbits have quantized energy levels. And with quantized energy levels, not every energy being possible, all spread through here, but only definite energies, then we get spectral lines. We don't get a black body spectrum because not all energies are possible when we do these subtractions. There are only certain energies that are possible, and that only gives us certain colors of light from the atom. So here's another way to think about this. Instead of looking at the orbits, look at energy levels of the electron. So we have here all the way up to infinity. N equal 1 is the energy, the lowest energy state. Uh, that is minus 13.6 electron volts for, uh, for hydrogen. Um, and there's a, a missing uh, part on this uh, slide here. And that missing part is that there should be uh, divide by n squared on this 13.6. But it's off the bottom or, or missing in some other way. But energy level diagram for the atom, each of these has a definite energy value. When we get a transition for here, they're showing an electron moving from level 4 down to level 2. There'll be a difference in energy. That becomes the energy of the photon. That gives us the ability to calculate the frequency when we divide by Planck's constant and then we can calculate the wavelength. For hydrogen, these energies of whatever n you want, if n is a 1, then it's minus 13.6 electron volts divided by 1 squared. If n is 2, it's minus 13.6 electron volts divided by 2 squared. If n is 3, minus 13.6 electron volts divided by 3 squared. So you ought to practice and uh, do some of those calculations to find what the energies are for the hydrogen atom. They're all negative. Uh, again, that means the electron is bound to the nucleus. Then we have uh, other series of spectral lines in other wavelength regions. We've got the infrared, the Poshan series, and we've got the Lyman series um, in the ultraviolet. And to calculate these, we can't just use the Balmer formula. That only gives us the, uh, the lines in the visible spectrum. So there's the Rydberg formula for calculating those wavelengths. And this is 1 over the wavelength equals the Rydberg constant times the quantity 1 divided by n final squared minus 1 divided by n initial squared. And the Rydberg constant, 1.097 times 10 to the 7th with uh, inverse meters for its units. Um, so you should memorize these, the Poshans in the infrared, the Balmers in the visible, the Lyman series, is in the uh, ultraviolet. Um, so we can calculate any wavelength now with this more general formula, the Rydberg formula. Um, again, 1 over lambda here, and then we have squares of the n values. We're still talking about quantized energies and discrete positions of the electron in the atom, where this n is our orbit number. n equal 1 is uh, going to give us the Lyman series. In this situation, electrons from some upper level make a transition and end at n equals 1. 
For the Balmer series, the electron is in some upper level, makes a transition to n equals 2. For the Poshin series, the electron is in some upper energy level of the atom and moves down to the third orbit, the n equals 3. Um, another way of looking at this with the uh, energies that have been calculated here, you know, 13.6 divided by 4, the 2 squared, and it's negative, so minus 3.4 electron volts and so forth. Uh, so the transitions that form the Lyman series, some upper level landing at n equals 1. The Balmer series, some upper level landing at n equals 2. The Poshin series landing at n equals 3. Which of these look like there's going to be the greatest change of energy of the electron? Which series? Lyman, Balmer, or Poshin? For which case do we have the greatest change in energy of the electron state? And you should be saying the Lyman. They're jumping way down to the n equals 1 level. And as we subtract the numbers here, you know, uh, minus 0.54, minus a minus 13.6, we would get the energy of the photon. And that puts us out in the ultraviolet. It's a big energy. The energy gaps here put us in the visual range. Smaller energy here, the photons are less energetic. They're in the infrared. So our atoms, what have we learned about the atoms? You know, Rutherford has uh, let us know that we have a massive, dense nucleus. There are protons. Uh, later, neutron was uh, analyzed and found to be in the nucleus. Um, the Bohr model is approximately correct for hydrogen, but not for any other uh, element in the periodic table. And really, to get the best result even for hydrogen, we have to use quantum mechanics to get the correct energy values for the electron. Bohr made some assumptions about the electron in the atom. One of these is that the electron is in a semi-stable orbit inside the atom. Classical physics would say that because there's acceleration, there is electrical force and acceleration on the electron, it, the, it should emit light. Now, Maxwell said one way to create electromagnetic radiation is to accelerate a charged particle. Bohr said Here's an exception. The electron does not radiate continuously as it is accelerated. Um, they do not continuously emit light. Uh, they only emit light when they make a transition between energy levels. So the electrons have discrete energy values. They don't uh, have all possible radii orbit uh, numbers, but the, uh, they have certain selected radius numbers and consequently a certain energy. Uh, the atoms emit light at these discrete wavelengths that are found by doing the energy difference calculation from where the electron started to where it ended up. Also, the uh, angular momentum of the electron is quantized. It comes in packages. And we'll relate this to de Broglie waves. Um, so that's upcoming. And light is emitted when the electron gives up energy, when it moves from an outer orbit to a lower orbit closer to the nucleus. And we can absorb light if the electron um, receives the proper wavelength of light and receives a, the exact energy to move it up to an upper energy level, then there's a probability the light will be absorbed. If the incoming light is not the correct wavelength, meaning not the correct energy in that photon, then the atom is transparent to that light. Um, if the wavelength and thus the energy of the photon does not match an existing energy gap from where the electron is uh, in its current orbit, to when it would move to some upper orbit after absorbing the photon energy. If there is no upper energy level at that number that the energy of the photon provides to uh, uh, the new energy to the electron, then there'll be no transition, upward transition, no absorption. Absorption occurs when the incoming light has the correct energy to move the electron to an allowed upper energy state. Um, so hopefully your instructor will draw that on the board uh, in class and give you a little more information about that. But the Bohr model was useful. It does uh, predict the wavelengths of light that are observed, and it was another step in our understanding of the atom. 
Here's a drawing showing the Bohr orbits, uh, the first Bohr orbit, second Bohr orbit, third Bohr orbit, fourth Bohr orbit, and so forth. Um, these can be calculated out, and quantum mechanics it is interesting. Quantum mechanics can also tell us where the maximum probability is for an electron with a, a, a certain uh, a quantum number, say n equals 1, and it does turn out that the maximum probability occurs at the position of the Bohr orbit. Um, so we've got that uh, you know, kind of interesting uh, result here. This works for hydrogen. It doesn't work so well for the other atoms. And we get the proper uh, orbit numbers. Um, and this uh, the most probable place for the electron is going to be this close orbit. And that gives us the proper diameter for the uh, deduced size of the atom. Um, and it's about 10 to the minus 10 meters, roughly, across the diameter for the hydrogen atom. Um, so there was a great advance in our knowledge of the atom, the ability to say that the electrons were in certain orbits that Bohr calculated um, that have certain energy values. And we get the uh, resulting uh, light emitted when the electron makes a transition down to the uh, um, lower energy levels. And could let you know, too, that n equal 1 level, that's called the ground state. And an excited state would be some energy level with n bigger than 1. Um, to ionize an atom, we have to add enough energy to make the electron's total energy equal to 0. So if the electron is in the n equal 1 state, it has an energy of minus 13.6 electron volts. It would have to be given plus 13.6 electron volts to bring its energy up to 0. And then that, uh, that electron would be ionized. So the Bohr theory applies to hydrogen. Uh, the Bohr theory does not apply, does not predict correctly the brightness of the lines, and some lines are brighter than others. Um, the Bohr model can't help us understand how molecules are formed, how the electron uh, link together and, and form molecules, and there's some effect of magnetic fields on uh, on the hydrogen atom and other atoms that uh, can't uh, be explained by the Bohr model. But the Bohr model is a start. It's worth talking about. It's worth uh, working problems on. So that's what uh, we will be doing.